good evening, everybody. It's delighted to be with us once again. Um, uh, I'm so pleased that uh, you've all registered. We've got close to 200 people uh, who have registered and I'll come on board as we get into the webinar tonight. Uh, of course, as usual, the, uh, the webinar is uh, always sponsored by Vision Christian Radio, but I've got a special uh, sponsor tonight and um, I'll mention that uh, sponsor in a moment. The webinar host, Dave, uh, of course, is David DeLima, our New South Wales State Director, and myself from uh, New South Wales, and I'm the national webinar host. We have done a numerous number of webinars, and these are all on our YouTube website for anyone to go and have a look at, and also to um, go back and see what's happened in the past. But please make yourself available uh, to the YouTube, because they are free, and we provide them as a courtesy to our supporters and members. So please go to YouTube Family Voice. Very quickly then, uh, if I may, our sponsor tonight is Summit Consultants. They are accountants and wealth, wealth uh, consultants as well, and they've agreed to sponsor the evening tonight. So I'm delighted to have them on board. And uh, one of the partners there, Peter, of course, is a great supporter of Christian ethical investing. So thank you very much for coming on board, Peter. And it's good to have you supporting the webinar. Well, tonight we've got Christian ethical investing strategies and we have Alex Cook with us who's created Wealth with Purpose. And I am delighted to say that uh, Alex is, um, uh, is a person with a wealth of information to bring to us. But before I get into that, I'd like David to just open in prayer and, a, and an open commentary. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, Greg. And good evening, Alex, and to all of our webinar participants. Let's pray and commit our proceedings to God. Our Father, we thank you for your grace and goodness towards us, yeah. that you own the cattle on a thousand hills, and indeed you've created all of the cosmos and shared that with us and given us the stewardship mission. Help us to use it wisely, we pray. We thank you that you call us to provide for daily necessities and to not live unproductive lives. And we thank you that you give us the ability to produce wealth and thereby confirm the covenant. And so, Father, with those thoughts in mind, we pray your blessing would be upon Alex as he shares with us. May your blessing be upon all our webinar participants, that all of us may grow and be stretched in our thinking and be better stewards of the opportunities that you give to us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, David. Um, very quickly, if I may, um, I'd like to introduce Alex Cook, who's the founder of Wealth and Purpose, an organisation that equips Christians to manage their money wisely and to build a thriving kingdom business by combining the wisdom of the Bible with contemporary financial planning and business practices. Alex is passionate about helping Christians ensure that their financial house is in order so that they may fulfill the purposes for which God has called them. Prior to establishing wealth with purpose, Alex was a financial planner with his own practice. He sold his business in 2013 to follow his calling of training and equipping Christians to use their money for the kingdom purposes, which I think is wonderful. Alex is married to Sandra and they have four children and he lives on the central coast of New South Wales, which, of course, Alex, must be God's kingdom up that way as well, I suspect. Well said. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, now I need to allow you to share. So I will allow all panellists. So you should now, I should be able to now share, I think. Um, all good. Good to go. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you, Greg. And thanks, David, for that uh, introduction prayer. Um, so the topic tonight, ethical Christian investing. Um, it's a really interesting area, and it's an area that I think you'll find that over the next 10 years um, evolves and grows significantly. Ethical investing uh, is something that's probably been going in Australia for 10 to 20 years, but it has been a very small, small sector, but really in the last few years has gathered a lot of interest in the general, with amongst the general public. Um, but of course, there's a whole Christian dimension to this as well, which I want to explore tonight um, and some of the opportunities uh, that we have. Um, I'll pass on the prayer part because David's kindly done that for us already. Um, just a disclaimer, because we are going to have quite an extensive Q&A at the end. 
just important to say that this is for education purposes. A lot of people in these webinars um, like to ask personal questions, more than happy to answer any questions, but it's more just to say that it's general, what we call general advice. Um, you know, I'm not here to recommend any products or anything like that. So just important to say that at the, the outset. Two second background, um, and Greg's really touched on this already, but Wealth with Purpose is a stewardship ministry. Basically, all we want to do is teach what the Bible says about money and how do you apply it in a really practical way. That's the goal of our ministry, with the intent that ultimately King, Christians use their money to fund, in my view, eternal kingdom purposes. You know, I'm 45, can't believe how quickly my life is going, uh, and I want to make sure that my time on earth counts uh, and that the money that God has put in my hands also goes to good use, and hence the name Wealth of Purpose, um, because there's nothing wrong with wealth per se, but it is about using it for purposeful activities. Um, uh, I did have a, an old financial planning business. We actually do have a new one. So um, that's been going for three years. We do um, financial planning and mortgage broking as well. That's something um, that we started, started doing again three years ago, just because i got so many people asking me, who do you know for financial advice? So we decided to open up another one. Now, what are we going to cover tonight? A um, couple of things I want to really jump into. First, I want to begin with a biblical mindset to wealth. How should we be thinking about it as believers? Um, then I want to touch on some biblical investment principles. Um, people are often surprised to discover how much the Bible actually says about money and investing. In fact, there are 2,350 verses on money, wealth, and possessions. Um, so it's a huge topic in scripture. Uh, and also it's the ultimate heart issue as well. You know, if anything's going to take you away from God, money is one of the things that can well and truly do that. Um, we're going to obviously touch on the key topic, ethical investing. What is that? How does it work? Um, what are the challenges? Because it's not as easy as it may sound. There are easy ways of doing it and more challenging ways. Then on to our impact investing. This is a, an area that I think is going to be, have a huge opportunity long-term for Christians. Um, also, I want to touch on where do you start? So where do you actually get started with this kind of thing? And then there's also resources just to further your learning and so forth. So biblical mindset is what I want to impart first. How should we be thinking about wealth biblically in fact um i think david when he was in, when he was praying actually pray, prayed this particular verse i don't know if you realize at the time it's deuteronomy 8 verse 18 um, it says you may say to yourself my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me but remember the lord your god for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant which he swore to your ancestors as it is today okay which is exactly what you pray, David. Um, so wealth comes from God. But there's another part to this, of course, is that wealth is for God in the sense that we are to use it for his glory. Um, one of the things when I think you observe Australia today, um, there's a part in there at the start of verse 18, it says, remember the Lord your God. And I think one of the sad things of Australia, as we've gotten more and more prosperous, and in reality, Australia is one of the most prosperous nations on earth, um, Yes, there's inequality and all sorts of issues, but nonetheless, it's a very prosperous nation. But I think one of the problems as we've become more prosperous is that we've forgotten the Lord. We've forgotten where it all comes from. And that's a real danger for Christians. Money is a, um, it should be a tool in our hands for doing good, but it can also be a horrible master too if we allow it to take control of us. And that's why we've always got to remember that it all comes from God. I always say to people, there should be complete humility in the body of Christ because if you've got a lot of wealth, it was God that gave you the ability in the first place. Um, so very important to start with. And secondly, then I want to touch on one of my favourite parables. And this is the parable of um, the talents, also called the parable of the gold bags, depending on which version of the Bible you read. And it's this fantastic story about the master who goes away. And before he goes away, he gives out bags of gold to his servants to entrust and to do things with, to earn a return. You know, one gets five, one gets two, and another gets one. And it, interestingly, it says each according to his ability, something that I think we overlook in that passage. But then he, he expects that they're going to go away and get a return on his money while he's away. And really, this is a, as what I think is the ultimate stewardship passage in, in the Bible. Basically, God has entrusted each, each one of us with different amounts. Some of you on this might have very little. Some of you might have a lot. You might have millions and millions to invest. But each of us has been given some and there's an expectation that we will do something with it that we will get a return for god now of course that's not necessarily a financial return 
because of course you could apply this to your personal talents, the skills that God's given you, and of course, stewarding the time on earth that you have as well. But obviously I'm looking at it from predominantly from a financial perspective. And here's the thing, at the end of the day, Jesus has entrusted us with something, each according to our ability. We have to put it to work so we've got to actually do something with it. We can't just sit idle with what God has given us. You know, I always say to Christians that money should flow through us. It shouldn't stop with us. It should actually just flow through you. Um, and of course, Jesus wants a return on what he's given us. That is, you have to sow with what he's given you. And there's all sorts of things you can sow into. It doesn't have to be just, you know, a share market investment. It could be sowing into kingdom things with the money that he's given you. Because ultimately, we are stewards of his wealth. It's a very important um, you know, concept to understand. We are stewards. Um, and stewardship, what does is, what is the word really mean? You know, on the great website, stewardship.com, offers this definition. And I think it's a really handy way of thinking about it. And that is that stewardship is managing God's blessings. And let's be honest, in Australia, we have a lot of blessings. We're very fortunate. Um, but then we've got to do it in God's ways. Now, that's where the wheels can come off. And that's why talking about ethical investing is so important. We've got to do it God's ways. And then, of course, we've got to do it for God's glory. So at the end of the day, the money is God's. And this is the first issue to understand with the money we have as believers. The ownership actually is God's. You know, Psalm 24 verse 1 says, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. And then, uh, you know, David quoted, you know, the cattle on a thousand hills. So there's all, all this uh emphasis in scripture that really what we have is god's and we are to use it for his glory so that's what i wanted to start with just this biblical idea that everything i have is god's that's the first thing and that we are called to be stewards now what i want to do is jump into some of the principles so these are the things that we see in scripture that give us indications of how we can invest so there's 10 principles i want to run through it the first one is really an obvious one if you're going to invest anything you've got to save okay now a lot of Christians, and I've had in our workshops over the years, people say to me, oh, Alex, should Christians accumulate wealth at all? Shouldn't we just give it all away? You know, like what Jesus said to the rich young, you know, the rich young ruler who said, I've followed all the commandments all my life. And Jesus said, yes, but you haven't done one thing, you know, sell it all. And that's not actually, well, that actually wasn't his point. It was the fact that Jesus knew his heart was completely tied to the, the money. Um, but what, the first thing you've got to do to have anything to invest, you need to save. And here's a great proverb from Proverbs 6 is, you know, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. So to me, the issue is saving is done for a purpose. You're saving for something in the future. Saving is about deferring consumption for a later date. Um, so it could be for retirement, could be for, um, you know, kids' education, could be for kingdom activities that you have in mind. But either way, you need to save. The second one, and this is one of my favourite ones, is diversification now if you go and see any financial planner one of the concepts they'll talk to you when they about talk about investing your money is the need to diversify and you hear the classic cliche you know don't put all your eggs in one basket well <clears throat> he's uh, from ecclesiastes 11 verse 2 invest in seven ventures yes in eight because you do not know what disaster may come upon the land now what, what a very apt passage when you consider the pandemic <laughs> over the last 18 months right the very apt scripture the point is don't put your eggs in one basket make sure you diversify your money because you don't know what may happen third thing planning and research now these are jesus's words in luke 14 he says suppose if one of you wants to build a tower won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it so in other words there's a diligence aspect here you need to plan things you don't just um, invest money without having properly thought it through and, and, and plan the process. So to me, um, this is a very important thing that's overlooked. And a lot of people want to outsource the responsibility, even though I want to encourage people to get advice. And that's actually another scripture in itself. Um, you do need to take personal responsibility for the money that God has put in your hands. There's an onus on you uh, to learn what the Bible says, to learn a little bit about investing. Yes, you can rely on, on advice, but you do need to ultimately plan it and think it through carefully and think about the pros and cons of what someone is telling you. You can never assume these days that it's what they're going to tell you is 100% true or in your best interests. Principle four, get advice. So once again, from Proverbs, without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counsellors, they succeed. And notice here the plural says many counsellors. So whilst you may go and see someone for advice you might have an accountant a planner a lawyer there's different people you might get advice from but ultimately you want to hear from a few people 
because you want to make wise decisions. And so the other thing is it's always good to talk to people who have been there in the past. Um, I always say to people, be a little bit care careful about um, getting advice from family and friends because that can be very well-meaning, but not necessarily very good, um, particularly if they're not great with money themselves. So be careful who you get advice from. Uh, but nonetheless, a scriptural principle is to seek the wisdom of others. Okay, very important. Principle five, <coughs> be patient. Okay, now this is a tough one um, because of the human heart. Uh, it says a faithful person will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. Now, if you look what's going on in the stock market over the last six months, and indeed in the housing market in Australia, which has gone crazy in the last six months, there is a, what we often, we use the acronym FOMO, fear of missing out, okay? That's going on very heavily at the moment. And the key issue here is, you know, do not be eager to get rich. This is where people, you know, fall in love with money uh, and the kind of natural human instinct of greed kicks in uh, and it can get you into a lot of trouble. We need to be patient with the money God's given us and, and be wise in the decisions we make. We shouldn't rush and we certainly shouldn't buy out of fear. So just be very mindful about your decision making. Another one, and this is really contrasting to principle one. Principle one I showed you was the need to save, but hoarding is very similar to saving. The distinction being hoarding is the sinful aspect of it. And that's where you're basically storing money away for no meaningful purpose. Uh, it's often done out of fear. If you've grown up in a family where money was very tight, it was very scarce. Um, you know, if your parents struggled to pay the bills or maybe you saw their home got foreclosed, you know, you had some sort of struggles. Then this can be a very natural inclination where out of fear, we just hoard money away and therefore we're not generous with it. So the challenge for Christians, and there's a real tension here, is trying to find the balance between giving your money away and funding kingdom activities, helping those in need, but then also saving for, for things for the future. But without going to the extreme, which is hoarding, where you're putting away money for the future, you're not using it for any meaningful purpose, and it's just going to be passed on to someone else when you die. Um, so there's this real tension for Christians to find between living a very generous life and also saving and accumulating for future things that are important as a you know um, as a, an ordinary person managing money for their retirement and so forth. So the Bible warns about this, though. It warns um, that basically hoarding harms you. Okay, it harms you, it affects you. So just be very careful there. So principle seven, get your spouse involved. Okay, now not everyone on this call will be married, so I appreciate that. Um, and what often comes up in a financial planning meeting, um, sometimes once the relationship's been established, one of the partners doesn't even want to turn up to the meeting. And the reason for that is they see one partner is the money one, one's responsible for it and the other's not. And therefore they think, oh, you know, don't have to worry about it. But the reality is, when it comes to making investment decisions, you should both be involved. Sure, one partner might be the household administrator. One partner might be more business savvy or more interested in these topics. But at the end of the day, God created us. This whole two become one flesh is designed to protect you and bring balance to decisions. Because ultimately, when it comes to investing, what I've witnessed over the years, <coughs> particularly when I was a stockbroker, is men tend to take more risks. This is some generalizations here. Tend to take more risks, tend to be much more trading and very activity orientated um, versus women that tend to be more buy and hold type investors. So it can have a huge detrimental effect to your wealth unless you're both involved. Um, and also I think there's an issue of transparency here as well. So make sure your spouse is involved in the decision, even if they don't necessarily want that much involvement and whether they don't want... Um, uh, they don't see it as a topic of great interest to them, but you do both need to make decisions together as two become one. Now, principle eight, if something sounds too good to be true, guess what? Guarantee it is, absolutely guarantee it. Um, I've seen this time and time again. Um, and the, the thing here is if anyone's promising you a return above 10%, you should start to ask serious questions, okay? Because if you look at the long-term return on the share market and property, it's around 8 or 9% pre-inflation. If you take out inflation, it's more like 6%. So if someone's promising you more than 10% returns, you have to ask, how are they achieving it? Because a lot of this stuff is designed to tap into your, um, your emotions, to your greed, you know, human nature. And that's one, some, one thing the Bible warns us against. Um, and I've seen a lot of sad things over the years. Back when the global financial crisis hit, there was a, a company called, I think it was called Australian Capital Reserve. 
and they were offering income securities, had a yield about eight or nine percent. Term deposits at the same time were offering five or six percent. So of course, if you're a retiree, why, why would you not want eight or nine percent versus five percent? And of course, the inevitable outcome is they lost all their money because what they didn't realize is that these income securities were backed by leveraged property development. So these sort of things happen all the time. So just be really careful. Make sure you understand what you're investing in. Okay, just a, two scriptures here. Nobody knows the future. So um, look, it's very easy to pour through the newspapers, read every economist report. Um, and, and you know I've been doing that for, for over 20 years. And the reality is nobody knows the future. No one saw the pandemic. There's all these sort of things, um, but there's a balance here. There are warning signs about the future. You know, the Western world is massively over indebted. That's a warning sign, if you ask me. Um, and so if you read, read Proverbs 22, verse three, it says a sensible man watches for problems ahead and prepares to meet them. The simpleton never looks and suffers the consequences. So I believe that the Western world, there is gonna be a day of reckoning in the future when interest rates one day do rise. Now, whether that's in three years, five years, 10 years, I've got no idea, but there is a reckoning coming because you can't just borrow endlessly. But then if you look at Ecclesiastes 8, it says, since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else's what is to come? So in other words, be very careful to listen to all these people giving you predictions about where investments are going to go, because reality is they have no idea. But equally, you can look at big structural things and, and see how they might impact the future. Uh, principle nine, saving involves sacrifice. And really, this is the whole idea, coming back to principle one. Two, if you want to have money to invest, you've got to save. It's a discipline. It's about foregoing consumption in the future. It's a, an act of self-control. And a lot of people struggle to save and invest simply because of the lack of self-control. Um, but there's a sacrifice, sacrificial element of self-control that needs to happen for you to invest. Last one, principle 10, stick to quality. Okay, so if you think about it this way, it's God's money and I wanna manage God's money well. I wanna look after it. So it's gotta be an investment fit for God. So it's gotta be high quality. And so I'd encourage you to stick to things that are often referred to as blue chip, you know, blue chip investments, things that are sound investments, good reputation. Uh, they're, it, maybe they're well known or they offer a lot of transparency so you know what you're investing in. And there's a good um, passage in 1 Kings 7.10 where it just talks about the foundations were laid with stones of good quality. So the important point here is that your portfolio is built on investing in quality assets. Okay, you want to buy good things, not uh, speculative things like I'm sure there's going to be a question later about Bitcoin. In fact, I read an email from someone today about Bitcoin. So we're going to talk about quality and buying things that we know are going to last. Okay, oops. Let's get into ethical investing. Okay, now ethical investing is a is a term that will mean different things to different people, and I'm giving you here a I guess a secular definition based on a website in Australia, the Responsible Investment Association. And they define it as an investment process that takes into consideration environmental, social governance and other ethical considerations. In other words, it's not purely just about profit. You need to make profit, obviously, for investment to be successful. But there are other considerations to consider. And so this is an area that really in the last couple of years is now starting to get a lot of attraction. Um, some of it, a lot of it, though, is linked to climate change, and we'll get to that. Why that's, you know, some of the things going on there. But, but how does it work? So, with ethical investments, um, they tend to operate on a range of different criteria. The first is what we call negative screening. So they'll avoid what we call sin stocks. So sin stocks are things like gambling, um, alcohol, anything that's seen that could be harmful to a human or harmful to the environment are generally uh, what are called sin stocks. Now, once again, the challenge here, and we'll get into the challenges in a moment, is that a lot of these ethical issues mean different things to different people, okay? Then there's positive screening. So that's where you invest in things that are deliberately trying to have a positive effect on a particular area, okay? Um, and the big trend, and you're starting to see this discussed daily now in the newspaper, ESG, environmental, social, and governance. Uh, a lot of funds, uh, and this is a, a big, if you're on a company board at the moment, this is something that's going to be on your board papers now. It's a, it's a big topic that's constantly been raised. And that is how is your company dealing with the environment, any social concerns such as, you know, empowering of women and so forth uh, and any governance issues. Okay. That's a big thing and it's really taking off. Um, 
Then there's the ethical side of things where um, companies start to take an active ownership in businesses where they are literally going to the AGMs and act, being act, almost activist and trying to influence the companies in their decision making. And you're starting to see a lot of that. Um, you know, you're getting people buying shares in companies specifically so they can go to board meetings and have their say. That's, that's getting more and more. Uh, and that's becoming a massive issue. If you look at the industry funds in Australia, like um, Australian Super and some of these really big industry funds that have large amounts of money, they are now becoming much more activist because they own, um, they own huge amounts of shares. You know, uh, Australian Super's got over $120 billion invested in it. So because of that, they could have enormous influence on, on companies as a shareholder. And then there's the last area of impact investing. This is the one I want to talk about a bit more in a moment because that's the one that really excites me. And I think that's the one Christians also should be get really excited about because that's where you can essentially invest and have a positive impact at the same time. And that's where I think there are huge opportunities, um, particularly for solving poverty whilst at the same time making an investment return. So these are the criteria that ethical investors tend to look at. Um, when you look at the universe of ethical investments, they all apply a different approach. So some of them are very environmentally conscious um, and others are more focused on other things. And it'll all come down to who the provider is. Now, here's where it gets grey. Now, the problem with ethics is a relative concept. So if I was to pick on Christians for a moment, let's take alcohol. Some Christians, probably a significant number in Australia, drink, drink alcohol, right? They drink wine. So they have no problem buying an alcohol company. Yet others don't drink at all. I've got friends that don't drink any alcohol. And so this whole concept of ethics can be quite a relative concept, it means different things to different people. So the challenge for you as a believer is to find investments or funds that align with the ethics or issues that you are concerned by. And that's where it gets more challenging because you'll find that the, um, some of these funds are just going off very secular models. So many funds are ethical by their definition, but they're not necessarily biblical, okay? Um, now, historically, there haven't been many players, there haven't been many ethical funds. There's big ones out there like Australian Ethical. Um, there is, if you look in super, there's things like Christian Super, uh, and there's a few others out there, but this is a growing space. It is getting more and more common. And a lot of the big fund managers that now are adding ethical funds, and a lot of them are adding what we call sustainable funds. So they're adding uh, into this space. So it's getting more and more common. Um, but here's the challenge for a Christian. When it comes to ethical things, where do you draw the line? Okay. So for example, should a Christian buy Woolworths shares? Now let's pick on Woolies for the moment. Now, most of you, when you think of Woolworths, right? Woolworths is a supermarket. However, it also owns multiple liquor stores. But what a lot of people don't realize is that something like nearly, I think it's 800 to $900 million of their revenue comes from poker machines. They're the largest pokey owner in Australia. Um, there have been talks I think, about them divesting it, but they're massive pokey owners, right? So the, the challenge for Christians is where do you draw the line? Now, if I said to you, um, let's, let's talk about Australian banks. Now, if you look at the major banks, um, you could say that their behaviour in many instances has been unethical. We saw that with the Royal Commission. Uh, we've seen that with them underpaying staff. We've seen that with um, all sorts of different things. And in many cases, sponsoring causes that are anti-Christian, okay? If you look at a lot of the legislation that's gone through our parliaments in a few years, many banks have been supporting those. Yet, I'm pretty sure everyone on this webinar would have money sitting in a large Australian bank. So this is, the, this is the challenge here of ethics. You can see at what point you, are you as a believer going to draw the line. So to me, um, you have to be very clear as to what you will and won't accept, what your conscience dictates in here. And also very much, and this is where the, the uniqueness of the Christian faith kicks in, is your personal relationship with God and where you feel he's leading you, okay? Because I'd be willing to bet that most of you will have your money in super funds uh, that have unethical elements to them, okay? And that's this is the challenge. It's not that easy to deal with. Um, so these are the sort of things you need to grapple with, and I would argue you need, you need to wrestle with these um, and be very clear on them. Um, because the challenge is here, some of the... Ref so I think scripture in itself is very absolute on certain issues. Some things are absolutely crystal clear. 
Other things though, uh, have an element of relative nature to it. Many ethical investments, um, and this is the challenge, are not necessarily easily available to the average person. And of course, it also comes down to the degree of detail that you wanna go into, in terms of researching. Because I'd be willing to say that if you scratch the surface hard enough, you could find some unethical nature to many, to many businesses in some sort. And of course, there's issues around supply chain issues, there's issues around how they treat staff, there's all these sort of things. So the question is, to what degree of detail do you want to go in? Now, the good news is there are sites out there now that are actively researching these things. There's a thing called the Ethical Co-op that actually researches this. So that does some of the work for you, and you can have a look at that. Um, also, you got to be careful with some of the concepts. So sustainability... A lot of these funds are really more geared around climate change rather than any Christian ethic. Um, so you've got to be think very carefully about what you're getting yourself involved in. And if you think about the topic of climate change, uh, that is a very polarizing issue in the Christian world and have, people have very strong views. So a lot of ethical investments are very much around that whole climate thing. And so you have to decide very carefully what you actually want to have your money invested in because you will be potentially having a very a big influence on companies and so forth long-term as this space grows. That's an area I'm happy to unpack, unpack in Q&A, um, but that's a very big issue um, in terms of what are you really, what, what is your money ultimately gonna be doing? Then there's the issue around index funds. So many of you would have heard of a concept called index funds. This is, if you think about on TV at night, you've probably seen them promote what's called the All Ordinaries Index. The All Ordinaries Index is, you know, the top 300 companies in Australia, makes up about 95% of the stock value. Now, in that index, there'll be good companies, bad companies, gambling companies. There'll be all sorts of things in there that are not necessarily Christian. But a lot of people have their money in index funds because they're cheap, they're very diversified, and they're simple. And so very, very common strategy that many advisors use. But um, in fact, I think Christian Super have actually interesting, interesting just introduced an ethical index. So they take out the sin stocks. Um, but nonetheless, that's a challenge for people who want to have a cheap investment solution. Another option for you is you just buy investments directly. So for example, you buy direct shares and you just choose the, to avoid the ones that you think are unethical. You know, you can avoid gaming, you can avoid um, stocks that you think are harmful to, to people or the environment and so forth. So you can do directly and that helps you overcome it. But that does then involve more research and you taking a much more active interest in your money. And not everyone wants to take a, a very active interest in the day-to-day -day investing. And of course, then there's managed funds that you know, advisors like myself use. Um, there, there, there are lots of very good things about managed funds for investing, but sometimes you don't know what's in there. And this is the issue, you don't know what's in there. Um, and, and this is once again, this comes back to the whole conscience issue. And to what degree are you gonna deal with the ethical issues here? How, 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 how much detail do you wanna get into? Um, but there is a, a plethora of growing ethical investments and ethical managed funds. This is a space that is growing very, very quickly. Um, so that's some of the challenges. Now, the last area I wanted to jump onto is impact investing, because I think this is the real opportunity for Christians. Um, to me, and this is so I've taken this definition off Christian Super's website, because I think it's a really good definition. And that is impact investing is investing into companies or funds with the intention of generating a measurable, beneficial social or environmental return alongside a financial return. Okay, so... Financial return is a given. You've got to make a financial return or you don't invest, right? However, there can be many other measurable benefits as well, whether it's social, environmental, et cetera. Uh, and this is a growing space. And historically, it's been much harder to ever participate in, but this is a, an area that's growing very rapidly and a lot of exciting things are happening here. Now, let me give you some examples. So one of the things that's developed over the last 20 years and some of you might have heard of it there's a charity out there called opportunity international and they're involved in microfinance now microfinance is something i love because what it is it's in, in uh, lending small tiny amounts of money usually two or three hundred dollars to people in the third world mostly mostly women funnily enough 70 to 80 percent of the loans are to women and what it does is it lends them money so they can start their own business Okay, and then they pay the loan back and then they can borrow more money as they need to. But let's say if I was a poor person in a country, they may lend me the money so I can buy a sewing machine. I can then go and make clothes. I can then sell those clothes. I can then hire people to make the clothes and all sorts of things. So microfinance is banking on a minuscule sale, on a minuscule scale, right? 
and it's very popular. And the beauty of it is you're lending money. So you're actually getting a return on it. But at the same time, you're lifting people out of poverty. Now, this has been going on for 20 odd years. Um, and it is a very, very good way of doing it. And of course, they, they do it very carefully. There's all, you know, the ethical issues. They're not, they're not trying to enslave people into debt. And if you've ever heard me talk in our ministry, I'm very anti-debt. Um, so this is just really useful ways to help people get started and get out of poverty. And it's making a massive difference around the world. So that's one example. Another example could be hospitals. You're investing in a hospital. Hospitals obviously charge fees for their services, but often they're providing lots of services to people in poor countries and helping them as well. So it's a balance here between getting a good social impact and creating hospitals in poor places, but equally getting a return as well. Um, so that's a growing area. In Australia, um, you can invest in disability accommodation. So this is things under the NDIS scheme. Um, and you can invest in that accommodation and you get a return for that. Um, and uh, at the same time, you're helping people in need who have physical you know, disabilities um, have accommodation. Now, this is just touching. This is just literally touching the surface. But what I want to encourage you to think about here is just this idea that as believers, you can invest and make a real genuine rate of return. But at the same time, you can have a kingdom purpose to it that solves particular problems. Um, if we take poverty, for example, of the 2,350 verses in the Bible about money, wealth, and possessions, um, 900 near, I think it's nearly 900, it's certainly a couple of hundred, are around helping people out of poverty. So that's a massive um, thing for Christians to be doing. Uh, and I think in countries like Australia, because of our strong Centrelink and all this sort of stuff, we're, we're almost very, we're very disconnected from poverty, very disconnected. And I find that that's problematic because... Christians here, I don't think necessarily understand just the seriousness of the problem. Um, but it's also a serious opportunity for us as believers to make a huge difference. Um, so that's, as so I say, microfinance is exciting. Um, but I think impact investing is a great area um, for the future. So where do you start? So we're just finishing off here. I think it's the last slide now or second last slide. Where do you start? Well, firstly, I think you need to decide whether you're going to get advice by go and see, speak to someone, or you're going to do it yourself. That's the first things. Once you've decided that, then you're going to start doing your homework. And there's lots of things you can research around ethical investing, thanks to the wonders of the internet. Of course, you're going to have to decide at some point where you're going to draw the line, draw the line from an ethical point of view. What do you consider to be ethical? What do you consider not to be? And that's got to be, you know, in your, you know, your conscience. And of course, as best possible, aligning that with scripture. You know, I think some obvious ones like gambling, I think those are really obvious things to avoid. Um, but other things are a bit grayer. Then, of course, there's your super versus non-super. So pretty much everyone on this call probably has money in a super fund. So you might choose a fund that specifically ethically invests or alternatively has ethical investment options for you to choose from. And that's a growing thing. Then of course, there's your non-super money. You know, you might be going to buy property, you might be going to buy shares, all these other things with your non-super money that you can invest ethically, okay? And there's different ways you can do that. Uh, next thing you wanna do is work out how much you're gonna start investing in the first place. You know, you're gonna start dipping your toe in the water with a small amount of money. Some of you might have large amounts of money, but how much do you want to invest? Um, and then, of course, you, you at some point, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to go the direct approach where you choose specific investments like specific shares or you're going to use managed funds where there's a bit less transparency, but you can find things that generally align with your values. Okay. And then, of course, the other big one is how much risk you want to take. Because uh, unfortunately with investing, and look, we're only doing this in 30 minutes, <laughs> but the reality is investing, I could talk about all day. We could talk about things like asset allocation, shares versus bonds versus property. We could talk about all these kind of things and we can certainly touch on those in Q&A. But the point is how much risk do you want to take with your money in terms of capital risk um, and, and there's other risks as well, inflation risks and taxation risks, all sorts of things. Um, but how much risk do you want to take with your capital? But there's some starting things just to get you thinking. Um, and as I say, there's lots of websites now around that, things like the Ethical Co-op, um, there's Christian Super, there's Lutheran Super, there's all these things out there uh, in, in what is a very much a growing space, okay? And I do think the real option for Christians here is impact investing. I think that's going to get exciting over the next 10 years as those options are intentionally created. Mm. So that's not something that's been easy in the past. Okay. So... Um, just in terms of how we can help you, look, if you go to our website, wealthwithpurpose.com, there's truckloads of free resources there. 
Uh, there's free eBooks. Um, there's a thing called My Toolkit that helps people with budgeting and getting out of debt. You can look at some of our past webinars on our website. Um, there's online courses. In fact, we've got one specifically called Christian Investing. So lots of resources on our website that you can access, download stuff. Um, not, most of it's free, not all of it, but some, the vast majority of it. Um, so please check that out. Love to see how we can help you build up this biblical um, skill set and mindset. And for those of you who want um, personal help, we can do that as well. On our website, you'll see access to financial planning and mortgage broking and other things if you need help. Happy to, um, uh, to assist with those things as well. So that's it. That, that was trying to get uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, yep. information into a very short period. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. Um, much appreciated. Uh, while David is getting the questions there going, just a quick one from me. Um, you mentioned Christian Super, Alex. Yes. To what degree should we be uh, persuaded by the name Christian in a business sense? I mean, if I use the word Christian, uh, you know, fund manager, doesn't mean I'm good or bad at it. So what, to what degree a, should very... we be persuaded by the word Christian? Uh, that's a that's a great question. And the same applies, I think, to financial advisors. Mm. I could hang out my shingle and say I'm a financial planner and I'm also a Christian. Mm. But I could still be operating very much by worldly principles. Mm. Like um, if you look at a lot of the financial planning training, there's a lot in there about getting people into debt and gearing them up. There's our, one of the obsessions in the Western world is leverage and borrowing money to invest. Mm. That leads to all sorts of potential problems in the future. Yeah. as a business we're ultra um conservative about that kind of thing um so just because someone says they're christian I mean they might still be operating very much under worldly principles mm. yeah um you. so you've just got to i think ultimately the thing i say to people is you've got to do your due diligence yeah. because ultimately it's you standing before god giving an account of how you steward stewarded his money mm. so you can't assume that, as you say, because something has a Christian label on it, and the same with applies to all these other labels, whether it, you hear the word sustainable and ESG, all these sort of things, they don't necessarily translate through to godly principles. Uh, and so you've just got to ask the question and be willing to do the homework. And that's where I think people can, you know, there's a danger of being a bit lazy about that. Thank you. David, over to you. Mm. Yes, we've got some excellent questions for Alex this evening. Firstly, is money itself evil? And didn't Christians in the early church give everything away? Ha, great question. It's a very <laughs> So the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, not money. Money in and of itself is neutral, okay? Um, the love of money is the problem. So the real danger with wealth, and a lot of the, the, um, the Bible verses, and there's many of them, are really warning passages about what money can do to you. I think one of the things that the devil has done so successfully is he's used money as a weapon against Christians. And that is he can either get you very enslaved, so you, you fall in love with it and you, you, you become you idolise money. And if you look at the obsession of home, uh, home ownership in Australia, I think that's become the national idol. Home ownership, by the way, is a good sensible thing, <laughs> but you can end up idolising money. Um, then you can also have fear, fear. And what happens with fear is you tend to withhold. So as a Christian, we're called to be generous with money. But if you're fearful about it, then you're going to withhold. So there's all these spiritual dimensions to it. So it's not money that's the problem per se. It's the love of money. And in fact, where, where Jesus says you can't serve God or money, he actually um, he uses the term um, mammon, if you look in some of the older versions. And with that version, mammon is when money takes on godlike characteristics and it becomes an idol that people serve. So that's the real danger. But there's nothing wrong uh, with Christians having wealth. The issue is what you do with it. And what I think God's primary concern is not whether you have wealth, but whether it has you. So the second part of that question, Alex, didn't Christians in the early church give everything away? Ah, yeah, no, good question. Why? Um, so the answer is uh, no, but they were willing to. So if you look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, um, it says they were willing to sell property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So the early church 
were willing to sell. So in our culture, particularly in church culture, we tend to talk about tithing and just giving a portion of our income. Whereas to me, in a true biblical culture, as back in the early church, and you can read Acts, Acts has got some fantastic verses, but chapter two, verse 42 to 47 is what I've encouraged people to read. It says, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So that's a huge one. Um, the other two passage, two chapters to read are 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. They summarise a lot of the principles around generosity. Um, but there's no evidence that they gave everything away. Um, they were just willing to part with it in order to, uh, you know, help help those around them. Alex, okay, another, qu okay, another sorry, okay. question. Alex, uh, is it true that the rich are getting richer and the poor <laughs> are getting poorer? Uh, yeah, well, I think... Uh, it's interesting. I think what we're witnessing, particularly in countries like Australia and America, you're witnessing the decline of the middle class. Mm. That's what you're witnessing. Um, in, in, in many, uh, it, it's very diverse across the world. The more countries adopt free, and this, is, this will get controversial here in terms of economics, but the more countries adopt free market policies, the more naturally wealthier they become. So what you're witnessing in countries that were historically had a very tight grip around them, the countries that adopt free market principles ultimately start to prosper because you're enable you're, what you're enabling is human flourishing. But if you look at what's going on in the West, we're getting uh, and look, everyone on this call will be in different industries, but I'd be willing to say that almost all of you in your industries are subject to more and more regulation each day. Um, and I think that's representative of a society that as it moves further and further from God, you get more and more regulation. That benefits the rich because they can pay people to do it. And you're starting to see this extreme inequality. The biggest offenders, I believe, of this are the central banks, because what they're doing around the world is they've brought interest rates down to basically zero in many countries. You know, the cash rate in Australia is 0.1 of a percent. Um, and that benefits the rich, because if you're a rich person, you already own lots of assets. You're watching your assets rise in value. But if you're someone who is trying to get on the ladder, whether it's starting a business or um, buying your first home, all of those things, they, they're getting harder and harder because you're having to borrow so much money to get in and to do those things. So to me, my biggest fear in the Western world is the shrinking of the middle class. Um, and you're going to see uh, a lot of massive tension increase as that occurs. And it's largely driven by central bank policy. Thank you, Alex. A quick one while David looks at another one. Uh, when I was growing up and I'm got married, our interest rate was 11% on our home loan. And uh, I was lucky because it was fixed and it went up to 17, 80% under Paul Keating and what have you. There's a question here that's come up, which I'm very interested in, Alex. Is there a correlation between Western debt and interest rates? Oh, ab absolutely. And it's almost 100, I'd, I'd go to say it's almost 100% correlated. Um, if you look at interest rates, in 1990, as you say, in Paul Keating, you could home loan was 17%. Mm. They, like, because we have a mortgage broker service, I was talking to clients today of borrowing at 1.8%. You know, 1.8%. Mm. I mean, you, you never would have even have dreamt of this five years ago, let alone, <laughs> let alone 10 years ago. Um, and so if you look at that, and then if you look at debt, the debt has gone up exactly the same pace. Of, in, in, you know, they're almost inverse to each other. Mm -hmm. And of course, the problem now is Australia is the second most indebted household on earth, mm. okay? Um, our, debt to, our debt to income ratio back in 1990 was 60%. So for every dollar earned, 60 cents was borrowed. That's now at 194%. So for every dollar earned, $1.94 is borrowed. And to me, I, my personal belief is there is a day of reckoning coming. Now, whether that's in two years, five years, mm. 10 years, I've got no idea, but at some point, interest rates will rise, and that to me will be enslavement. Yep. So one of our much of our ministry, in fact, I had this when I started it in 2013. I, there was a number of things I felt God was saying to me, and one was literally was to attack debt. That was the expression I had: attack debt, um, because it our culture is all around borrowing as much money as you can. There's this view that you need to borrow in order to gain wealth. And that's very, very misleading. It, it can work wonderfully well, but when it goes in reverse, it's wonderfully bad. 
It's horribly yeah. bad. So, yeah, interest rates yeah. are going to be our Achilles heel in the future. Thank you. David. Yes, that's a question, Alex. Are returns from ethical investments as good as the returns from investing in the wider market? That's a good question. Um, look, there are a number of different researchers out there that suggest that it has makes no difference. So I've seen some in the last six months that say uh, that ethical investing actually leads to better results. But for the most part, over the last 10 years, it's been much of a muchness. So in other words, I think the reality is you taking an ethical approach will not detrimentally affect your money. Because that's, that's a concern people have. They think if I you know, take that approach, will I end up with a, a worse result? And the answer is no. Um, the, the research does not suggest that you'll be worse off by taking an ethical approach. Okay, now if someone has some uh, cash on hand, so to speak, should that money be spent paying off the house more quickly or investing in superannuation? It's a great question and possibly the most common question I ever get. <laughs> uh, it's one of the issues we address in every financial plan. Um, there's no black and white answer, but I'll give you some of the conceptual issues. Um, the general principle is you pay off your debt first, okay? The general principle. And the reason for that is simply that, A, it's more certain. So if, let's say I've done a budget and I've got a surplus cash flow. Mm -hmm. With that surplus, I can either, as you say, salary sacrifice and put into super, or I can pay down the home loan. Now, paying down the home loan ultimately creates more certainty because there's no investment risk by paying it down. And it, it, the debt is then disappearing and you're not paying interest on the debt. Because you've got to remember that interest is dead money. People always say rent is dead money, but interest on a home loan is dead money as well. So ultimately, general principle is that's the best bet because it's the safest bet. The, the salary sacrificing, though, has a tax benefit because most of us are paying at least 30 cents in the dollar for our tax, at least, the average Aussie. And therefore, by salary sacrificing, mm. super, you're getting a tax benefit. You're re reducing your tax to 15%. But you're then exposing yourself to investment risk. And that will all come down to where that money is invested. And some years, like last year, you, your super might fall 20%. And other years, it might do really well. Given the environment we're in, um, if I was a betting man, I'd be much, always, and I'm probably, I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I'd be certainly leaning towards always pay off the mortgage, particularly mm -hmm. given that interest rates I would expect are going to spike at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, I think we're heading into a lot, what I call a low return world. Um, if you look at the last 40 years, bonds have gone up for 40 years. Uh, the shares have been booming for the better past since basically the 1988 or 1987 stock market crash. They've done really well. A few blips along the way, but they've done ultimately extremely well over the last 30 years. Um, and like, likewise, real estate. And all of these things, I think, a lot of them have been aided by cheap money. In other words, cheap central bank money. And I think now that rates are so low, I think going forward, things are going to be, it's going to be harder to make good returns in the future than it has in the last 20 years. Okay. That's, that's my view. It's a bit sobering, but yep. um, I think that's the reality. Another question from, uh, or concerning the Bible, doesn't scripture teach that we should lend without seeking interest? Ah, good question. Yeah. So it's the concept. Um, in, you often hear the concept of usury. The, the, my, look, you, you read different scholar, scholarly opinion on this. Um, the conclusion that I've personally come to is it is okay to lend people money so long as it's not as extortionate rate. So to me, a bank lending you money at 2% has certain risks attached to it, but nonetheless, I don't see that as a, an unethical issue per se. If you were doing what they call, I mean, you've probably heard of things like payday loans, um, shark loans, all those things where you are charging very extreme rates of interest, those to me are unethical. And they are often designed to trap people. And so those things, that's where I think interest is, um, is sinful. Um, I'm trying to think of the particular passage from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 23, 19. Yeah. Neither uh, lender nor borrower be. <laughs> yeah. So as, as I say, the main issue from scripture that I've seen is is it's perfectly okay to, to, to lend someone money so long as you're not trying to extort them. Mm. That to me is the real issue. 
another question. Uh, should we only pay cash for things or is it okay to borrow money and is it okay to use credit cards? Uh, some very good questions in that. Um, so I'm generally very negative on credit cards. I encourage people to use a debit card. One of the reasons why people use want to use credit cards is just because of the you know supposed convenience around online transactions, et cetera. But the vast majority of banks offer what we call Visa debit cards. And that's where the money is coming out of your actual savings rather than borrowing from the bank. Um, and those accounts, many of them are fee free. So I am against credit cards because um, to me, they encourage excessive spending. They, they're almost addictive. It's like a, mm. in fact, I was in America a few years ago and the pastor referred to it as plastic crack. I, it's this sort of addictive substance. Mm. Um, and so I always say to people, go the debit card, not the, the credit card. Um, Cause I think you'll avoid yourself so much heartache because the interest rate on a credit card sits between 18 to 20%. But what people don't tell you is that if you have debt on your credit card, you're only ever forced to repay about 3% of the balance every month. Mm. Now, that means if you only pay 3% per month, it will take you 30 years to repay it. Okay, so the interest rates are huge. Mm. So a four grand credit card over, um, over 30 years, you'll end up spending 15 grand in interest just on a four grand debt. So, yep. and I've seen people get trapped by it. Um, there's a lot of agencies, by the way, that can help people get credit card, credit card debt written off and so forth. Thank you, Alex. I've got a quick one for you. This may seem a bit, seem a bit personal, but the question it wants to know is setting up a perpetuity when in a superannuation pension drawdown phase, the gold standard to ensure that you never run out of funds in retirement? Uh, like an annuity, I assume is what they're referring to? I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Um, look, but they are attractive in the sense you get a guaranteed income. The problem with them though at the moment is the annuity rates are just so low mm. that essentially you're locking yourself into something that's guaranteed low rates. If you took one out in the 1990s, you were laughing because <laughs> the rates were so much higher. But unfortunately, if you take them out now, you're actually guaranteeing yourself a low income forever. Yeah. Um, the other thing is once, depending on the annuity product, and they are, there's some complexities to them, um, often, even though you get a guaranteed income, once 10 years has gone by, if you die, then the company that's issued the annuity keeps the money and therefore your family gets none of it. Whereas with the traditional super fund, your family gets all the balance, less any, any taxes that are there due to be paid. Um, so generally, I'm not a huge fan of annuities. Sometimes there's a, you can do what we call blending, where you have your superannuation pension plus a bit of annuity. So you get kind of part guaranteed, part, part um, variable. Um, but you, you really have to understand the pros and cons. So one is an estate, estate planning detriment. And the other thing is the potential that you're guaranteeing low rates forever. Thank you. Alex, here's a slippery question for you. Are any of the major banks in Australia considered by you to be ethical? <laughs> <laughs> be careful, Alex. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, look, I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> they're created with profit in mind. And unfortunately, I think one of the sad things in our culture now, um, in big corporates in general, not just in the banks, is the excessive nature of executive remuneration. And what it is, it's a merry-go-round where they're all, they, they pay for these external consultants to give them advice on what they should pay. And they talk about being about a global marketplace and all this sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's all rigged to make sure that they all get paid these huge incomes. Um, the bigger issue I have with it is a moral one. And that is if I'm a shareholder in a bank or any stock, is that ultimately as the shareholder, I'm the one wearing the risk. But the problem now with executive remuneration being what it is, where these guys get paid millions, is they have no risk other than potentially losing their job. Apart from that, they've got no capital risk, but then they get paid these huge salaries. So to me, it's very unevenly weighted towards the executive and less away from the shareholder. And that's where you gotta be careful. In America, it's far more extreme. So there's a concept some of you might have heard of called buybacks. Mm. And this is where companies can buy back their own shares. And what's happening in America is executives are borrowing money at 
you know, one percent or less, buying back their shares. Now, what this does is it makes the company, it reduces the number of shares available, makes the company more profitable per share. So the real profit hasn't changed, but the profit per share has increased, which makes the share price goes up. But what it means is the executives then pay themselves huge bonuses because their profit's gone up and they haven't actually improved the operations of the business. They've just managed the capital. And so that sort of practice is very rife, especially in the US. And to me, it's the shareholders, the one wearing all the risk, but the executives, the one getting all the benefit. So yeah. you have to be very careful of these things. Thank you, Alex. Thank we're going we to run out in. of time. Yeah, sorry, David. Uh, okay, can we go squeeze on. in one more yeah, question? Yeah, go for what, it. What, yep. what, is crypto, what is cryptocurrency and is it a good or a bad thing? <laughs> uh, one of the most common questions I get these days. Um, so cryptocurrency is this new technology called blockchain. And mm. if you're asking me to explain blockchain, good luck. I've got no, <laughs> I have no ability to make it. But basically, they're seen as these alternative currencies that you can mm. invest in mm. um, as an alternative to, say, the Aussie dollar or the US dollar. Um, and they are, they're gaining huge popularity, and there are thousands of them out there. Um, the most popular one being Bitcoin. There's a few other really popular ones, but Bitcoin's the most well-known one. Um, I have a number of concerns with them. Um, firstly, the technology itself is very good. And many of the banks and central banks are exploring this technology. And it's, it's highly probable. And when you look at scripture and prophecies around one world government, one world currency, you can see, you can see all of that is well and truly in motion. You can just sort of see it coming true before your very eyes. Um, so I think these technologies are very real and here to stay. The problem I have with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin is that they're impossible to value. Like, how do you know what a Bitcoin is worth? Um, now, a lot of people are piling money into them because I think, oh, you know, the central banks are printing all this money and devaluing their currency. Therefore, I'll buy Bitcoin. But it doesn't really protect you. And it's unbelievably volatile. I mean, Bitcoin, uh, I think it was a week or two ago, fell 20% in a single night. Wow. Mm. So that to me, um, to, so to anyone listening, I'd say Bitcoin and crypto is very speculative in nature. Mm. Um, I take the stewardship point of view that um, it's God's money, so I shouldn't gamble or speculate. Um, in saying that, I do know plenty of Christians that do own crypto. And all I'd say is that if you go down this path, that it's a very, very small percentage of your assets, i.e. Uh, you're not exposing yourself to unnecessary risks. Um, you have to also understand that the government doesn't like competitors. So if you think, you think that the government is going to let crypto... Uh, have a negative effect on the Aussie dollar or the US dollar, you're kidding yourself. The government at the end of the day always wins. They're the ones that write the laws and they're the ones that have the military. So anyone who thinks that Bitcoin is a way of bypassing the economic system, I think is kidding themselves. Thank you, Alex. Can I give you one recommendation for your clients? The Greg Bonda Retirement Fund, Alex, is um, one highly regarded, very <laughs> ethical. David, over to you for prayers and in conclusion. Thank you, David. <laughs> I thought you were going to refer to the Greg Bonda Luncheon Foundation uh, <laughs> in your remarks there. But uh, no, let's, let's now uh, just turn to God once again. Now, Father, we thank you for the excellent teaching and advice we have received tonight, the biblically-based wisdom that's been shared. Help mm. us to apply it, we pray. Help us, as the scriptures say, to not be arrogant or to put our hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put our hope in you as you richly provide us with everything for our enjoyment. And we thank you for the command that we should do, we should do good and that we should be rich in good deeds and that we should be generous and willing to share. So as we apply the teaching given to us tonight, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alec, thank you very much on behalf of the Family Voice supporters, members, the governing board. We are delighted to have a Christian man like yourself to talk about a very, very personal subject such as money, investment. So, Alex, what I'll do is there are a lot of questions here. If you don't mind, I might send you those and you can choose to answer them or not, and I can pass them on okay, um, cool. to the people that ask them. But can I thank everybody for coming? We really appreciate your support. And it will be on our Family Voice YouTube if you want to just check up 
on tonight's um, presentation by Alex. Once again, Alex, thank you very much for coming and God bless and um, we sure will talk to you again. Good night, everybody. Pleasure.